Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm going to be talking about uh, geodesic first and second order methods for MoMA maps and polytopes. This is joint with Peter Burgesser, Ankit Garg, Rafa Oliveira, Michael Walter, and Avi Wignerson. So <laughs> we're going to be studying actions of groups, such as the invertible matrices, GLN, on vector spaces. And in particular, we're going to be talking about optimizing the norm of a vector over the group orbit, and also its gradient. So we're going to generalize some very familiar methods from optimization to work in this setting in which we don't have Euclidean geometry. So here's a brief outline. So the groups we're going to be working with are going to be groups like GLN, uh, the group of diagonal matrices, or products of GLNs. And an action on a, a vector space is a homomorphism from the group into the group of n by m invertible matrices. And we'll write G acting on B as G dot B. For example, uh, a matrix acts on the vector space of matrices by conjugation. Here's a simple example. Some other examples. Uh, this action comes up in operator scaling. If you have a tuple, you can act on the space of tuples of matrices by pre and post multiplying them. And you need that transpose to make it a, a group action. And similarly, there's a group action on tensors by acting on each tensor factor. Triples of matrices act on three tensors <coughs> by acting on each tensor factor. So our main problem is, if you're given a vector in the vector space, you want to infimize the norm over the group orbit. You want to compute that quantity. So this has a bunch of surprising applications. I won't be able to tell you why too much, but it comes up in a lot of places. And, uh, and our, our sort of goal today is to get, is to solve this optimization problem so we can get at these other applications, especially the algebraic applications. So here's an example, a familiar example, hopefully. Uh, if you have a bipartite graph, one way to tell if it has a perfect matching or not is to look at its incidence matrix and actually look at this group action. So this is going to look a little strange, but it's a, it should actually be familiar if you know about Sinkhorn's algorithm and matrix scaling. So H has a perfect matching. If and only if the minimum norm under this group action is bigger than zero. So this group is pairs of diagonal matrices with determinant one, and you act on A by pre and post multiplying by them. So if you can send the norm to zero with that group action, then the matrix doesn't have a perfect matching. This is equivalent with the existence of X and Y diagonal, such that the scaled matrix B is doubly stochastic. But here we have this weird version of doubly stochastic, which is probably not what you're used to. Uh, what the version I've written there actually says is that the L2 norms of the columns and rows are all one, but the, these problems are completely you know, equivalent. But this is the version that generalizes better for us. And this, this one, two, three here is going to generalize nicely to the, the non-commutative setting. And why does this hold? Well, it's basically because the, the gradient of this objective function, by the way, that, that f means Frobenius norm, it means you sum the squares of the entries, the gradient of the objective function is exactly the thing that you want to set to zero if you want it to be doubly stochastic. So it's basically, this, this theorem is just calculus. So I'm going to tell you about the analog of the row and column sums in the non-commutative setting. Um, it's really just the gradient of the log norm, but for some historical reasons, it's called the moment map. And, <clears throat> and for other reasons, which will be clear later, you also put e to the x before you take the gradient. So as I just mentioned in matrix scaling, uh, it takes this form, and there's another normalization factor because of the log. 
Another example is uh, the conjugation action. Uh, takes that form, and in general, you know, if our group was the invertible matrices, the moment map is going to be a Hermitian matrix. For matrix scaling, it happened to be diagonal matrices. Okay, so we had our ancient theorem for matchings, and that the analog of that in, in our more general setting is going to be the combination of the Kempf-Ness and Hilbert-Mumford theorem, which tells us that the infimum, the, the least, or the infimum over the norm is greater than zero if and only if you can set this gradient, the moment map, approximately equal to zero. And then if and only if, well, the thing that corresponds to a perfect matching is actually much different sounding, but we don't really need to get into it, but it has to do with whether homogeneous invariant polynomials vanish on the point B. So the, these homogeneous invariants are the analogs of perfect matchings, and what this theorem tells us is that we can get at this third bullet point through optimization, not having to do algebra, which is great. Okay. So <clears throat> let's define our objective function that we want to optimize to be the log of the norm, and just set this parameter opt to be its infimum. So our, our quest is to, given a vector v, produce g star uh, with the function value being at most opt plus epsilon, or determine that opt is minus infinity, which it could be. Um, so there's been a few algorithms for special cases and an al al algebraic algorithms for the decision version, you know, analogous, analogous to whether there's a perfect matching. Uh, so the decision version would be, does opt equal minus infinity or not? And in general, we would like to optimize f, but it's a bit harder. It's easier to optimize the gradient or to set the gradient approximately equal to zero. So our easier problem is the scaling problem. Uh, given a vector v, produce a, vector, uh, a, a group element g such that the gradient is as small as it possibly could be. Um, so for instance, for this problem, we get poly one over epsilon time algorithms. Uh, and this sort of is more or less, you should think of it as a fairly easy task. For instance, we can do it for tensors, this tensor scaling action I mentioned, which we can't do norm optimization for the tensor uh, scaling question, but we can do this, this uh, scaling problem. Okay, so now, before I tell you uh, sort of what our guarantees are, I want to mention a case that has the same flavor as the general problem. So which parameters are making things hard or easy? So the problem is polynomial optimization. So imagine you have a Laurent polynomial with positive coefficients. We have another ancient theorem that says that the infimum of this polynomial over the positive orthon is bigger than zero if and only if zero is in the convex hull of the exponents that are showing up in this multivariate polynomial. This thing also has a name, it's the Newton polytope. And the combinatorics of the Newton polytope are what determine the difficulty of this optimization problem in, in the commutative case and also in the non-commutative case. So <coughs> this problem if you do a, a, a sort of easy change of variables, which is just set xi to be e to the yi, actually is a convex problem. So it's very easy to solve this problem. But if you only have access to, uh, oracle access to the polynomial or the gradient, it can be quite difficult. Uh, like, you know, maybe your polynomial doesn't even have a, a polynomial number of, of uh, monomials for you to evaluate it at. Um, and so what, what controls the, the, oracle, the complexity with oracle access are these quantities. One is the weight margin and one is the weight norm. So this quantity gamma is the closest a subset of these, uh, uh, oh sorry, there's a typo. It should be the closest that a convex hull of any subset of the exponents can come to the origin without containing it. 
So you imagine all of these uh, vectors in z to the n, and they have a bunch of convex holes, and how close those convex holes can be to the origin without containing it. Um, that's the weight margin. And then the weight norm is just, you know, the biggest one. How big is it? So Strashok and Vishnoi show that <coughs> you can optimize uh, with poly one over the weight margin, and uh, that should be poly uh, in Oracle queries. So weight margin being very small is bad. And this is actually shortchanging uh, Nishith and uh, Damien's result a little bit because the, the quantity gamma is actually worse than the quantity that they, they have. But, uh, but anyway, this is the, the flavor of what happens in the non-commutative case as well. I won't be able to tell you what gamma and n are there because of you know, the technical difficulties, but suffice it to say there's some things that feel very, very similar. You, know, you have a bunch of points in Zn which are determined by your group action and you look at the closest that they can, that a convex hull of them can come to the origin without containing zero. Okay, so here's what we do. Um, we <coughs> give a first order algorithm for the scaling problem, which works in time poly in this weight norm, the optimum, and one over epsilon. And a second order algorithm, uh, which yeah, both of these algorithms have just oracle access to the, uh, the norm and this gradient mu. Second order needs access to the Hessian. Uh, but this one outputs uh, a point whose value is close to the objective value. In time, poly, but it depends, and it depends on log one over epsilon, but one over this gamma. And this quantity gamma could be quite large. Uh, opt is always less than or equal to a polynomial for any reasonable input model. Um, but this gamma can be large, or uh, one over gamma can be, can be quite large. And the size of it explains all of the hard and easy cases so far. So operator scaling is an action that's considered very easy to deal with, as is conjugation. And the, the one over the weight margin in those cases is a polynomial, it's into the three halves. And you, you prove this using just some sub, submodularity uh, argument about this uh, Newton polytope. And tensor scaling, the case which I said is difficult, has weight margin at least two to the n over three, which basically has to do with, with the fact that you can cook up some points in z to the n whose hyperplane uh, through them comes really, really close to the origin. Okay, so let's talk about the algorithms. The main moral of the story for the algorithms is that they're extremely easy convex optimization algorithms. It's just that we defined how to do them when you aren't working over a linear space, you're working in a group. So, okay, so we already have uh, a problem. So this is our objective function from before. The naive change of variables that we tried for Laurent polynomials, which was just, you know, set xi to e to the yi, we can try that here, try to set g equals e to the x, but that won't be convex in the Hermitians. Uh, there's already a two by two example where it's not convex. Um, but it does have the property that it's convex along lines. So if you look at f of e to the tx, it is going to be convex. So geodesics are analogs of lines in a non-Euclidean space. In the group G, they're going to be of the form e to the tx times g. So you left, left multiply by this e to the tx thing. <clears throat> and the general idea is to do the usual optimization algorithms, except when something tells you to go along a line, you go along a geodesic. Um, an example of a, a non-Euclidean geometry is the hyperbolic plane. This disk is the space, and the, uh, the geodesics, which are sort of the analogy of lines, are these funny 
uh, segments of circles passing through this disk. And uh, the geometry we're looking at is going to be negatively curved, like the hyperbolic plane. Yeah. So we say the function is geodesically convex if it's convex along geodesics. So what is geodesic gradient descent? Well, you compute the steepest geodesic, and then you go along that thing for some step size, and you just keep repeating this. Uh, and the uh, way you figure out what the steepest geodesic is, is this gradient, which is the left-hand side of that equation. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not gonna say why it is that, but trust me that it's like the simplest thing you could write down that makes sense. And it also happens to be exactly this moment map that sort of is why that this gradient had this funny expression. Uh, the moment map is the same as the geodesic gradient of the objective function. Okay, so I'm just, I don't think anybody needs this actually. I'm gonna say what gradient descent does. So you set a direction to be the geodesic gradient, and then you go in that direction along the geodesic beta length, okay? And so in the hyperbolic plane, maybe you started near the boundary, and your geodesic sort of told you to go towards the center, you would go along this half circle for a while, and then you would maybe go along a different half circle which, in which the gradient pointed, and so on and so forth. So the, anal uh, the analysis is pretty much standard. The problem we're trying to solve is to make the moment map small, you know, analogous to finding a doubly stochastic matrix. We want to make the row and column sums approximately one. <clears throat> and more or less folklore that if you have a smooth function, which means that its second derivative is bounded along any line, then uh, geodesic, uh, sorry, gradient descent converges in uh, basically one over epsilon squared time. And that, that argument is going to carry over, and it turns out that our function is in smooth, where n is this weight norm quantity that I mentioned but didn't define. And it's actually very easy to prove that, the, the, that this function is smooth. So anyway, as I mentioned, the, the standard analysis carries over. At one of the steps, the gradient is small. So the second order method, I don't want to get too in depth about it, but now we're not just trying to get the gradient to be small, we're actually trying to optimize this function. And we're gonna use something called a trust region method where we consider a second order approximation for f times uh, f of e to the xg. So that's a quadratic approximation. And the algorithm is quite simple. We, uh, at each step, choose a Hermitian which minimizes this quadratic form, subject to it being small enough. So we want to minimize it over a small ball and then we just go in that direction, okay? So it's like, <clears throat> at each point, you look at a ball around you, you approximate the function, you go to the least, and then you just keep doing that again. again, again. So the, analy the analysis, I think, is standard. What you need is something called a diameter bound, which is just that you don't have to look very far to get close to the optimum. And if, uh, if this is the case, that you have a di diameter bound, then you can regularize this function, which means add something to make it steeper, uh, so that this algorithm takes polylog one over epsilon, uh, d and opt time. And our, one of our technical contributions is to find such a diameter bound, which depends only on this combinatorial information, this weight margin. But yeah, I can't, I can't prove it to you now. Uh, the final thing I want to mention is, is moment polytopes, which is a generalization of the, the scaling problem. In matrix scaling, you could ask for a doubly stochastic matrix, but you could also ask for one with specified row and column sums. So the anal uh, analogy of asking that is that uh, your moment map take prescribed values. So this thing mu, takes a value in Hermitian matrices 
But it's a very beautiful thing that, in fact, the eigenvalues range over a convex polytope. So the eigenvalues of these Hermitian matrices as G ranges over the group, we're actually going to take values in a convex polytope. And there's really no reason that I could see that this would be true, you know, other than proving it. Uh, and there's a lot of neat examples of these polytopes. They're called moment polytopes, so polymatroids matching polytopes, permutahedria. Um, and what we can do is decide weak, mem uh, decide weak membership for these polytope problems, which means we can decide if it's in there or it's at least epsilon far from being in there. But that actually doesn't tell us the decision problem. That's an interesting open problem to decide membership in moment polytopes. Um, we need a poly log one over epsilon algorithm for weak membership or optimization or anything to do that. Okay, so finally, really quickly, I'm gonna just mention the open questions. So far we've done really easy optimization algorithms. We wanna know whether there's analogs of the more powerful optimization algorithms, like a geodesic ellipsoid method. Well, actually there is one, but apparently the oracle calls take exponential time. Um, and, you know, maybe there's some version of interior point or something like that. We don't know. And hopefully these will solve the norm minimization problem in polylog one over epsilon time. That's it. Thanks. Put an interior point method? Yeah, yeah. So it's wide open, I don't. Yeah, so we, we don't have really any idea about that. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there, there's big issues with like bit complexity and things like that because. Yeah, I think we don't have a candidate. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs>